Did everyone have fun? Yeah. Excellent. That's good. All righty. All right, just one more to go and then we can have cocktails. Um, this is Marketing on the App Store. I'm guessing you're here. If you're here, you have an app or are about to have an app on the App Store and you're looking for how to make it stand out above the crowd, how to make it like really shine, how to get lots of those lovely downloads and lots of lovely users. All right, I've been doing um, apps on the App Store since the iPhone 3G and uh, I've been spuddling a lot, trying different things. And this is going to be a talk mainly on like what things I've discovered on my own, things I've read on the internet, um, and just things I've discovered just, yep, yeah, just while playing with, with marketing. Who am I? Um, my name's Tim Oliver. Uh, I'm from the far, far away place of Western Australia. Someone asked me if, if I'm from England. I'm not from England. I'm a bit further away than that. Uh, it was worth the trip, though, because uh, Italy is way prettier than Australia right now, because it's very brown and not hilly in Australia. Um, I majored in a bit of an interesting degree. I did half computer science and half uh, multimedia. So that was like, every week was like SQL databases and then straight into like Photoshop graphic design and animation and then back into like data structures and then back into like filmography. So I like to think I've got a bit of a, a balance in like designing and developing. So like a jack of all trades but master of, master of none. Um, I, I was a web developer for about five years before I transitioned mainly like purely to full-time iOS development. Um, oops, that's out of order. And my hobbies are app development, video games, kara and karaoke. If you don't believe me, here's a picture of me at a karaoke tournament last year. I came second. I, I lost to a young lady who sang Let It Go from Disney. There you go. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Alrighty. <laughs> Thank you. Um, beyond, like, when I said my hobbies are app development, um, my current pride and joy in my free time is I'm trying to make a uh, DRM-free comic book reader. His name is iComics, because iComics was still free when I checked. Um, the idea of this one is, unlike all those other ones which are walled gardens for their own comic collections, this is one that you can, you can buy your own comics and download them in like PDF format, and it's mainly just a platform so you can consume them on your iOS device. Uh, but I've been working on it for about three years, and um, the great thing about having like a little side project like this is it's a really good way to teach yourself iOS development and just have a play with, to see what's actually possible. So. Um, I've learned a lot about core animation by doing custom animations. I learned a lot about threading by having to do like a lot of multiple processes, like pre-processing image data to display to the screen while the user's reading a comic, all the things like that. And the, and the one thing, the main thing I learned about this one was um, uh, data, like offline data. Um, this thing was run, running on core data for two years, um, which was really painful, I have to say. Like anything involving core data and threads is really tricky. I think there's a talk about that today. So that's, you know, that shows how tricky it is. Um, so my, one thing I did last year was I actually migrated over to uh, a technology called Realm. Has anyone here heard of Realm? Yeah. One, two, couple? Okay, cool. Okay, yeah. Um, and basically, uh, it was really cool. Um, this is like as far as the plug goes, I swear. Um, because it was re really just a matter of like pulling out the core data code and then putting in the Realm code. It took about two hours and it ran really nicely. So. Um, I made a huge ruckus about that online, um, saying like, guys, check this out, like, this is way better than core data. And Realm heard about that and they offered me a job out of that, so that was really cool. <laughs> so if you haven't heard of Realm, check it out, there's the website. We've got a lot of videos as well from the stuff we do. Okay, so where are we at? So on iOS, you, might not, you may or may have noticed, we have this thing called the App Store. And it's the only way that you can actually get an app onto your iOS device, officially. There are other ways, but um, this is the main one that we'll, the ma ma main customers will use. Um, so this is, your, this is like everyone's first port of call and they want to download an app. Um, yep, yeah, so it's the only gateway. Um, there's a lot of apps on it. Um, at WWDC this year, Apple was really happy to announce there's over 1.4 million apps on the App Store now. But what they don't mention is a lot of it's abandonware. Like, I did a, I did a, a look up, there's about 100,000 apps that were built for iPhone OS 2 still on the App Store, still available for download, um, which is a bit of a shame because this is like a, a quantity over quality sort of thing. So now, now what's happening is like a lot of dead apps are on the App Store and it's really hard to get noticed as a result. Like um, I used to search for to-do because it's, it's a very big trend. Um, you know, like, the, the, like certain categories are just absolutely sh saturated, which is um, really, it's really hard to get noticed because even if you're competing against polished apps of your level, there's also a lot of old dead apps that by sheer virtue of being there longer than you, sometimes rank a lot higher. So suddenly you have to compete with dead apps as well as competitive apps. Um, yeah, which is a big problem. So what can you do about it? Well, the thing is, everyone said, whenever you ask this, the first thing people will say is, just build a great app. And you know, build it and that will come. Uh, but that doesn't really happen. I mean, it, it's, it's good to think that would happen, but no, that doesn't really happen. Has that happened to anyone here at all? 
No? Yeah, see, it doesn't happen. Um, yeah, it's like the, mat the, the, the crux of the matter is if you want to actually get, an, um, get people to notice your app, uh, you have to like make sure it stands out, it has to be really polished, it has to, has to be good, and, and above all, you have to tell people about it, you have to market it, you have to make sure that every impression you give with it is a really good impression. So I'm going to, do, I'm going to talk in basically two big sections. Um, I, I don't want to want to use the word app store, uh, app store optimization, ASO, but it was mentioned this is basically the first half will be how to optimize your app store page to make it look as pretty as it is. Um, these are a lot of observations I've made and a lot of things I've read online. Um, yeah, the first impressions are the most lasting. So basically what I mean by this is um, you have to make sure your app store page looks as nice as it as possibly can. I mean, every single aspect should be as polished as possible, so potential buyers will see it and go, okay, that looks like, I I say, that looks like someone put actually effort into it. Let's give it a try. Um, so first things first, we have the app title. So, so this is not the name of your app specifically. This is what appears next to the icon on the app store. Um, and in general, there's a few things you should do to differentiate your app name from the app title in the app store. Um, it should be easy to spell. Um, I've got a, not really a competitor, but I've got a, a, another, another app that does comics, but they do, they special in web comics, but they're called Comic Chameleon. So whenever I try and show it to a friend, I have to figure out how to remember how to spell chameleon, because it's a very, not a word you use every day. Um, so I always recommend like trying to, keep it, trying to keep it to the point where it's very easy to spell, or if it's like a, a name like Tumblr, you just like, see, it's like Tumblr without the E, like a very easy way to describe. Um, plurals are confusing. Like everyone I've talked to calls my app iComic without the S, and I'm like, no, no, that's not how it is. Um, and that also com compounds when you've got um, like localizations. Like there's no concept of plurals in, in like Asian languages, like Japanese and Chinese. So um, pronunciation on that is pretty tricky, and and they also forget it a lot of the time. Um, and something I learned a little while ago, um, when talking to a few other Apple de uh, Apple app developers. Um, is you've got to make sure that even if you do a search for that app name you want to use on the App Store, uh, even if it's available, you should always always check the trademark database. Probably the main one's the American one, which the address is there. Just make sure no one has a trademark on that name, because if they do, they're legally allowed to actually like flag it with Apple, and they could actually go after you for trademark infringement. So this is like a little thing you should always check when picking a new name. Um, I'll go into this in the next slide, but things like making sure that your your app title has got uh, not just the name, but a, a lot of, use of like the most important keywords you want to have. I'll explain, I'll, I'll explain that in the next slide a little bit more. Um, and another cool thing is when you actually add like a little bit of flavor text, you can localize that. So even if you keep your app name in English lettering, you can let international users know that your app is still translated to the language by actually translating that flavor text to their language. Um, yeah, and keywords. So when a user is searching for your app, and if they're on an iOS device, device they'll probably be searching for your app um, directly than actually linking to it. Uh, you've got two things you can control for that, and that's the app name and, and the keywords field in iTunes Connect. So this is the main way to explain to it to search for your app. Um, it's a 100 character limit, so not much to work with. Um, you don't have to put spaces between the words, which is really nice. You can save a lot of space, um, but they have to be comma separated, which is probably pretty common knowledge. Um, and, and the good thing, and the idea of these, these things is like, what if a user doesn't know the exact name of your app, what will they be searching for? So I've got ones like comic reader and viewer and watcher and like parser and things like that. Just things that people might put in uh, and any combination and any combination of those will actually work, uh, which is really cool. So it's a really good idea to just like make sure to, to, to pull back and think about what will users be searching for for this thing. Plurals aren't necessary. I put the word comics in mind for like two years before I found that out. Um, iTunes search is smart enough to realize that plurals, uh, pl like uh, a word has a plural. So you can always save extra space for, for extra keywords by not including plurals. And one thing I discovered um, is that even though you have keywords in this field, um, any keywords that you put in the app title are given more weight. And what I mean by that is, um, for the first two years, I just had my, my, my app name was simply just iComics, and I really wanted to get uh, a really high ranking if someone did, uh, did a search for Comic Reader. Um, I didn't want to like do that flavor text because I thought it looked kind of cheesy, and it always gets truncated on smaller screens. Um, but I finally went, what, what, let's do a quick, quick experiment. If, if, my, if my search results don't change, I'll put it back, but let's try it anyway. And it was kind of really ridiculous because I was ranking at like f number 45 for Comic Reader before that, and then it jumped up to like number 15. So it actually made a really huge jump, like after the app was released, after it was approved by Apple, like instant jump. So it just goes to show that whatever search algorithm they have, they put a lot of weight on the app name more so than the keywords. 
And um, this is probably just like, this should be common sense, but you don't, don't use the word, words like free or fun because like everyone's doing that as in an attempt to try and get like fun apps and that you will never rank in those ones. Um, hey. <laughs> uh, app icon. Um, did anyone here see Michael Flowerup's um, <laughs> awesome talk this morning? Yeah, yep, that was, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to try and compete with that because that was an amazing talk. Um, but so, yeah, I can't, I can't really, he's right there, by the way. I can't really... Um, comment on app icons and there's a wizard in the room with me. Um, <laughs> but I totally agree with what he said this morning. Um, the icon is most definitely the most important part of your app. That is literally the first thing a user will see when they're actually searching for your app. And it's probably the, it, well not probably, it is, it is the thing that they will form their initial opinion, saying like, okay, that is a, a well-crafted, beautiful looking icon, the app must be that quality as well. Um, it's also interesting to think that they spend a lot of time looking at on the home screen. So if it looks really bad or like unappealing, that, that is also a thing that <laughs> they, that they um, that will also consider. Like before iOS 7 came out, the only thing you could see in the search results was the app name and the icon. Like now we've got the screenshots, so we've also got a bit more content we can control. But back then, the icon was the main thing that would that would pitch to people that you actually have a really well crafted app. Um, yep. So most users will judge it by the icon itself. Um, and I did like like if you heard this morning, um, it's really important that these things scale. Like, I, I, every time I do an icon, I really test it at every size, like including the really tiny size in, in the app settings, because it can become so muddy and blurry that it just looks really, like, confusing. Um, and if you, haven't, if you hadn't seen it before, like Michael was going to do a demonstration this morning, but um, that template there uh, is available for download as a PSD, and it is really, really good. Like, I've used it for so many apps to just, just set, up my, set up how it looks and preview, and then to export. So I really recommend you get it. Um, so, about, apart from the icon, we have a new thing since iOS 7. Um, screenshots are now shown in, in search results. So not only do you have the icon, you also have the screenshots that users will be basing their opinion on. Um, so you've got two screenshots that are visible. So the first two ones are the ones that count. So that if you, if you can, whatever portions of your app are most act, like, actively viewed when a user is using it, whatever, whatever parts the user uses the most, is what you should have there. Um, yeah, so you should, you should definitely demonstrate what your app looks like for most of the time in these screenshots. Um, so how can we go about improving screenshots? I mean, so that's pretty easy. You can just, just take, you know, pull out your phone, press the, press the, the screenshot button, and there you go. Um, something that's been a bit of a rising trend lately is this idea of device borders. And what I mean by that is, like, instead of just having a screenshot of your app, a lot of uh, people are now taking a screenshot, then taking a template of a device, putting the screenshot in the template, shrinking it down, and then having a little bit of text at the top. And the great thing about this is, since the screenshots are visible in search results, this actually lets you add a little bit more text. So you can actually tell the, user, the potential user a little bit more about what your app is going to do. Um, and as you can see, a lot of the major players are starting to make that their default modus operandi for, for their screenshots. Um, the problem is, it's a lot of effort. Like, screenshots are a real pain in the ass sometimes. Um, <laughs> we've got five screen sizes, and, and come November, I'm guessing the iPad Pro is going to make us six screen sizes. You can do five screenshots per each, per each one. And for the sake of brevity, I said five languages, but I, my app actually has 10 languages. So that's like, like some unholy number of screenshots, which is really, really painful. I, I tried doing it manually once. It took like four hours, and I was like, that's it. There's got to be an easier way. There has to be an easier way. I'm going to go crazy doing this. And there is, thankfully, a really cool guy called Felix Krauss did this awesome set of tools called Fastlane. Has anyone here heard of Fastlane before? Couple? Yep, excellent. Cool, excellent, yeah. Basically, Fastlane is a series of little um, Ruby gem tools that, that try and automate every single possible facet from your Xcode project all the way up to the App Store. So it does things like provisioning profiles, builds, pushing to things like Test Flight or Hockey App, and then even pushing to the App Store itself. But one of the coolest things it does is it can actually automate the entire UI process of taking screenshots with a, a tool called, I think it's called Snapshots or Screenshots and automatically just doing it for every screen size through the simulator. And not only that, but there's also an additional flag you can set. So it'll also do that awesome device bordering as well. All you have to do is grab, grab the, the device template from Apple's uh, marketing resources, put it into the folder with, with, um, with the tool set, and it can actually take that and a bunch of JSON data di dictating what to actually say, and put it all together as finished screenshots all automatically. And so much nicer than doing it manually. Oh, yeah, it could also push it to, to iTunes Connect automatically as well, so you don't have to upload them manually. Um, and there's one other little thing. This is, this is kind of like a pet peeve of mine, um, and that's the status bar in screenshots. 
Like you've got, you've gone all this, you've gone done all this effort. You've developed your app. You've you've put it up on the app store. But then all your screenshots have like this at the top. It's got like the carrier name, an arbitrary time, and sometimes it's not even this. It's like someone's actual phone. So you've got a really weird carrier name and like two percent battery, and it just looks really like not polished. Um, and I really recommend that if you're going to go the whole hog with a good app, um, just as, just to show off how, like, how much polish you can do. You can, it's always best to try and match the one that at Apple does, which is um, no carrier name, full bars, full battery, and always 9.41 a.m. There's always a, a funny story behind that one. And the good news is, is this is really easy to do. There's actually a, um, you can just Google for this. It's a, it's a library on GitHub called Simulator Status Magic. If you just search for like magic status bar on, on Google, like I do, you'll find it. What it does is you just build it in the simulator, run it once, you hit a button, It'll do some internal hackery, and it'll, it'll force the simulator status bar to always show that. So you can then actually put that in tandem with, with Fastlane to generate your screenshots, and each one will have like a properly like Apple level like status bar. So there's one thing I can, like I can have you guys to walk away with. It's this because I really want to see more apps on the App Store with this. <laughs> um, description text that that big old block of text next to your app um, icon, like your app profile, uh, once you actually tap on the app. Let's be frank, no one really reads these. There's usually huge walls of text, and the user will probably will have already formed their opinion from the icon and the screenshots. It's only when they really want some proper clarification they might jump in, but depending on how large and how complex it is, they probably still won't really act upon the information there. I can say this because I've had a lot of one-star reviews from users saying, I thought the app did this, but it didn't, and I've actually said in the description, it doesn't do that yet, but it's coming. So I was like, oh, you didn't read the description, did you? Yeah. So, well, at, so at the very least, people might not base their purchase decisions on these descriptions. Um, they used to be they used to be counted in in the search algorithm, um, but that turned out to be a really really bad idea because apps started doing things like if you like Angry Birds, you should try this app to try and click like to try and gain some good uh, rankings from the Angry Birds keywords. So Apple put a stop to that a long a long time ago. So in, in short, I'd say for descriptions, don't make them too long. Um, one thing I've heard a lot recently is uh, since user validation is very important, you should always. Uh, if anyone's written a nice thing about your app, add some kind of quote to that, um, and maybe just do a really quick overview of features. Yeah, so good for user validation. Um, also, because this, the, your app profile page is visible on the internet, it's also really good for SEO. So if you actually want to, like, yeah, I went there, I said the SEO word, um, to actually make sure your, your, your app can also rank on, on Google, this is like a good thing to, to think about. Um, my f one of my favorite apps is um, Jetpack Joyride, which is a really popular game made by an Australian game developer. Um, as you can see, they, they've gone to town on all the awards they've, they've won, so that they really want to say, like, we're, we're really good, this is all the awards we've won, um, just, to show, like, just to show as, as an example of user validation. And then right below, you've got like three lines worth of an introductory description. And then below that, they've actually got all the, all the reviews. So they've, they've gone to town of like not only the awards they've won, but also the reviews people have written about it. So that's one example of, of user validation. Um, localizations. So if you really want to focus on a lot of users getting your app, you really have to think about localizations. This is, this is sort of a little bit out of the scope. Um, one of my colleagues in Perth, a guy called Stuart Hall, uh, runs a service called AppBot, which is really nice. Um, and he, he actually uses that service to um, to do an analysis of the App Store and see uh, things like how many apps are localized versus how many downloads and, and sort of things. And in, in this case, he actually used his, his, his platform to, to gauge how many different languages the reviews were coming in. And one thing he found was, of course, English is the major player, but right after it comes Chinese. So probably the two most important languages are English and Chinese. And I like how Australian English is at the bottom. Like apparently some people write reviews in Australian as opposed to English, but okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, so um, I really recommend, hang on, let me just go back there. Like he wrote a book about this. I really recommend you, you, you check, like just, just do a quick Google for it. It's called Secrets of the App Store. Covers pretty much everything I'm talking about here as well. Um, but he recommends like 50% of your user base will be English and Chinese. That's, that's the first two you should focus on. Again, like I said earlier, you can actually like app, like load your, your app title with localized description to help let users know that you are actually in that available in that language. And it's really it's actually pretty easy to localize. Like I'll show you how I do it for my app in a little bit. But like you can like, if you've got any friends who who might do it for a beer, or you can actually ask like a, you can go online and say, hey guys, I need some help. You can crowdsource it. Um, and Stuart even recommended in his book to go on maybe Fiverr.com because people are offering translation services on on, on those kinds of websites. 
Um, it's really time consuming, like I have to say, like I'm trying to balance 10 languages. It's like, okay, I'm, I'm gonna add one new string. I have to ask 10 of my friends to, to, to translate that string before I can ship. But ultimately it's, it's really worth it because the, the amount of uses you get as a result um, is really good. Um, how I've done it, um, I stole this technique from a, a friend of mine, Dean Herbert, who runs a, a really cool game called OS. He has a lot of strings in his game, and he wanted to get people. He wanted to translate his game to a different a pile of different languages. So what he actually did was he crowdsourced it by making a Google spreadsheet that had a list of all the strings in a column, and then every other column was a separate language, and just put it online and said, "Hey guys, could you please translate my app?" And and he got, like, it was really cool because not only was it translated really well, but it was sort of like self-policed. Like if someone tried to be a troll and put in naughty words, um, other people would come in afterwards and revert it back. So it was really good in the fact that um, when you've got a lot, of, like a lot of users and a lot of people are interested in having your app in different languages, they will contribute and they'll actually make sure it's a good translation. All right, and this is, this is a bit out of the spec and you can make a, you can make a talk out of this on its own. Um, so obviously the more, I don't know how the search algorithm works exactly because obviously Apple doesn't want you to know, but it seems to imply from what I've seen that um, more da the more downloads an app has, the higher it ranks. So on that note, it's, it's, it seems to like imply that if you can get more downloads, you'll, you'll obviously start ranking a lot better as opposed to things like reviews. So I think up, up front paid is a really hard sell because of that because you always have a lot lower set, like downloads than when it's free or freemium. Um, but obviously, if you, see, if you saw TweetBot 4 the other day, that's not the case because that, that skyrocketed instantly. Um, the fact that the App Store doesn't have a demo mode kind of encourages freemium. Like I think, I think Marco Arment once wrote that um, like if you have a free and a paid app a version of your app, like 80% of the people will just use will, will use the free one and stick with the free one, and they'll have like a they'll they'll put up with whatever limitations there are as long as it does the job thereafter. So um, it's always I always like I have a few friends who like to do free and paid, but I always think it's even it's better to just have a freemium model somehow to have everything contained in one app. Um, this is something I'm considering doing because I'm I'm paid at the moment, but I, I'm thinking about I want to grow my users a bit more, so I'm thinking about potentially moving the app to completely free and unlocked, but because it's like, obviously it's like a periodical format with pages, it will be possible to put like every now and then, depending how often the user's using the app, like a, a full screen iAd as one of the pages, something like that. It's something I'm thinking about trying. Um, I don't know how well it'll work. Um, but obviously free of ads, like I, I worked for a company a long time ago who, who did several uh, sets of apps. And they were easier, like they were actually able to like fund majority of their operations off, off apps. So if you have a sufficient user number, it is possible to to do to to make sufficient money with app ads. But it's yeah, I don't know. It's 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 really hard to say. Um, obviously, uh, I've seen this a lot. Like if you just up and release a really great app, users actually get skeptical. They're like, oh, there's got to be a catch. Are you gonna like sn sniffle my data or something? Like why why is this free? So even just like some kind of small like little monetization thing there can actually help. Like it's it's kind of ironic. It's like catch twenty two, but it kind of encourages user interest by by like saying yes, I am I actually have an ulterior motive. I want money, kind of thing. Um, this is one I added like a little while ago. Has everyone heard about Overcast two that just came out? Yep, nope. yep, yep. There's one. <laughs> so Mar Marco Arment, the crazy man that he is, um, just released a brand new version of his app. Originally it was freemium, where it was um, it was free to download, and you could test out the cool features of it. Um, but then you actually had to had, had pay to unlock them permanently. But what he actually did like uh, yesterday was he actually released version two where the entire app is now free. Everything's unlocked and anyone can use it. Um, and what he's asking for is, it's sort of like, a, he's asking for like an optional, it's called patronage. It's not really a donation, I guess, but it's like, it's like you know, he's asking for money, but you're not, you're not obligated or nor do you actually get anything else if you pay. Um, I'm very curious to see how that works because I've seen some, a few other apps do that, which, but they called it tipping, where it's like, they give you the app for free, and if you like it, then there's like an, an optional in-app purchase that does absolutely nothing, even though there's a restore purchases button, um, to where you actually um, are paying the developer, but you still get the app for free. So that, that might actually be the future. Like if you actually make a really, really good app, and a lot of people use it, and even if 5% or whatever actually do this tipping, it might actually be a viable business model because you're still pr providing a really good service to everyone. Either way, that, that, one, that one's a really interesting one. Um, Pretty much everything I talked about, it was, I was glad when I found this out because um, it was good to see that like, our ideas matched up. Um, this is independent research. Um, the AppBot guys, Stuart Hall, also did this as a bit of a promotional thing. There's a website called healthcheck.appbot.co. If you just put in your, your iOS apps, you are, um, 
like App Store URL, it'll actually go through and analyze every aspect of um, the App Store, pretty much everything I just said, um, and will actually give you a grade from D plus up to A, saying like, yep, this has got lo localizations, yep, it's been updated recently, yep, the, the, the title has a sufficient number of keywords in it, so it can actually grade your App Store page to see how, how, well, um, how well it's doing. All right, so I've got a little bit of time left. And the second half is, like, what can you do beyond the App Store? Like, what, now that you've actually made a really good App Store page, like, what can you do inside your app and outside your app to actually make it um, a lot more uh, appealing? Um, one thing is definitely listing reviews from users. So, the problem is, like, ratings are obviously a good, a good way to, to validate how good an app is. I don't know how well they, they I still don't know how well they work in the search ratings. Um, I'm guessing, like, Maybe not as much as downloads, but at the same time, when a user looks at it and goes, oh, wow, it's full of five-star reviews, this has to be good. Um, but the problem is getting reviews is hard because um, Apple doesn't make it easy. Like, it's like a five-step like, process of having to go into the app page, hit the reviews tab, put in your iCloud password, write out the review, and then actually hit send. So it's, it's not really easy to motivate users to do it. Um, and the problem is if you screw it up or you do something wrong, that you might piss them off, and then they'll, they'll, they'll do it, but they'll give you the wrong review that you want. Um, but the, the golden standard for a long time has been this thing called Apparator. Does everyone know about it? Well, one of my friends calls it, calls it App Pirator, because that's how it's spelled. Um, <laughs> the, and the basic crux of Apparator is you, stick, you just drop it into your app, and then um, every now and then, whenever the user opens the app, this little modal pop-up will appear saying, hey, are you, using, are you enjoying this app? Why don't you um, actually go and rate it? The problem is, it's a really disruptive experience. Like, it, it stops the user whatever they, from whatever they're doing, and they have to op, act, act, act upon it, which can be really irritating. Um, and, you know, if, if, it, if something happened, like if the app crashed, and then you, the user had to reopen the app from a crash and disappeared, then they'd obviously be really pissed off. So, you can also, like, really provoke users by, doing, by using it. Um, and a, uh, a very prominent chap called John Gruber has apparently started this campaign where he wants, people, he wants to encourage users to actually, if they see an apparator instance, to go to the App Store and then give it a one-star review saying, get rid of that modal prompt. Which I'm not sure if that's a good thing, because obviously a lot, of, a lot of legitimate developers are using it, um, and this is like kind of hurting them unnecessarily, but yeah, it's John Gruber. Um, <laughs> um, so one thing I'm trying out right now is like a really like subtle version of this. Like, so here's, here's a screenshot from my app. What I've done is when a user finishes reading a book, there's like this ending ending view. And I've done this little label at the very bottom, which is saying like, did you enjoy that? Well, if so, tap this, tap this button and it'll take you straight to the app store and you can rate it. So it's very subtle, it's non-modal, it's completely optional. Once the user does tap it, it goes away. So it cleans itself up in the UI. Um, it's possible, you can actually just yank the apparatus source code for this, but it's possible to take a URL and put it into your app that when you tap it, it will take you straight to the review tab on, on the App Store, which is really, really cool because it saves like the first three steps. Um, you can also do things like hook it into the iTunes um, API, so you can actually get how many people have downloaded, have actually rated it in your, re in your region and actually report that inside your app, saying like, why don't you rate this app? Only five people have done it so far. So that's really good. And, and, the, and the thing is like, if you can't read that, the, our user wrote a review saying, like, I really appreciate how, the, how you did the App Store review link. It's not intrusive and it gets the job done. So users notice and they're grateful for it. Um, this is really like, kind of like really, I guess it's really obvious, but you should always have a social media presence. Um, when users are asking, looking to ask for questions, they'll always come to social media first. So I have a, a Facebook, a Twitter, and an Instagram page. I'll get to the Instagram one in a bit because that's, that's a bit weird for apps. Um, but obviously, social media... Uh, Social media pages are really good because users will come and ask questions or ask for support. Um, they also rank really high in, in SEO. I said the word again. So it's, all, it's really good to actually get your, uh, your app name a bit more on the front page by having more active social media pages. Um, and I like Instagram because it has this really interesting hashtag system where when you actually fill a comment with hashtags, which is really dirty, um, a lot of people are watching them. So it's a great way to, for like organic discovery. Like more users will see it if you actually post pictures of, of like you developing your app and things like that with the appropriate tags. Um, beyond that, uh, this is really, really obvious, but obviously like, there's a lot of journalists out there, a lot of blogs who would really like to write about your app um, with the right circumstances. A really cool website that came out quite recently is submit.co. Um, that actually provides a list of all the blog posts out, like all the blogs out there, like iMore, TechCrunch and all that, as well as the links to the submission page. So you can actually go in and um, really easily go and say, hey, this is my app, please check it out. That being said, from what I've heard, like app reviewers really don't care most of the time unless it's a new app or like a complete revamp. So don't don't harass them for like a version 1.1.1 or whatever. 
Um, and one of, one of iMore's journalists, Peter Cohen, actually did a really good talk at OldConf this year, talking about his perspective as a journalist getting these emails and talking about how, how can you actually you know, improve your relationship with journalists so they will actually review your apps. Um, I've, got, I've got 10 minutes left, so I'm going to rush through this now. Um, press kits are really important. A press kit is basically just a, a folder full of screenshots and icons. This is so journalists actually have like visual assets on hand. They can write, they can just drop into their posts. So while you're up, so, sorry. Um, so when you're actually approaching them, also give them a press kit so they, they don't have to spend time making screenshots. They can just drop in the ones you've pre-prepared. You've pre -prepared. Um, and also adding like a little PDF explaining the app in, in such a way that, that like even a, a journalist could quote it is useful as well. Um, the best example I've seen is uh, Clear App by Real Mac. Like if you do a search for a Clear App press kit, um, you'll find it. It's, it's, really, it's really hidden on the website and it's literally just a link to their Dropbox and all the files are in their Dropbox. It's just a public Dropbox folder. Um, that's what mine looks like. I only did the screenshots, the review guide and the icons, but look at Clear Macs because they have things like, like videos and a lot of other things as well. Um, I'm probably going to even skip this one. Um, I think advertising on Facebook and Twitter is really good. They have like really good support for um, like apps these days. You just have to drop in your app URL and they'll, they'll pre-prepare an ad and it's not dirty like Google Ads a little bit. It's like it's usually really nicely integrated into the UI of their, of their official apps. Um, obviously, it's, there's money involved, a lot of money involved, so I don't really, I don't know how, you, your mileage will vary and it might not be worth it, so I don't recommend it if you're starting out. Um, and it's always best if you can get other people to talk about your app instead of advertising it directly. Like um, one, one time I made the app free for a day and a lot of people said, how can I, like they downloaded it for free and said, I like it, how can I help promote it? I just said, go, go onto forums and stuff and write about it and that helps a lot more. And if you haven't heard it before, there's a lovely website called Product Hunt. It's, um, it's really good for like getting the word out for new products. Um, you need to have like a friend invite you in so it's, it's, it's not easy to spam and that's a good thing. And I really recommend that um, if you've made a really good app, always try it on Product Hunt as well. Um, one cool thing I've noticed, like I didn't know recently, is um, with the new app analytics in iOS on, on, on iTunes Connect, you can actually create campaign links. So you can generate different links to your App Store page. So if you are creating different advertising campaigns for different sites, you can actually create specific links to work out where your traffic's coming from. Um, and this, we're going to get close to the end. Um, one thing that's not well known is, is you just tell Apple about your app. Um, they did a talk a little while ago in 2013 about this. They have a, an email address um, that you can email to say, hey, I made an app. Because obviously they don't check every app manually. And um, to say, I, I made this app, it might be good, it might be wor worthy of the front page. And, and if they, they'll, they'll always take a look at it and they might even feature it. Uh, the, the, the crux of the matter is you can't just make an app and hope Apple notices it. You actually can tell them about it. Um, they also have another email, which is that the app of the week program. So if you want to make your app free for a little bit, um, they'll also have an email address for that program as well. If you want more information about this, like yeah, most everyone's taking photographs, um, it's still on the Apple developer website in the 2013 Tech Talks. It's the video called App Store Distribution and Marketing for Apps. And I really recommend you watch it because it goes into a lot more information than this. You can do, they also talk about things like if you want to do like generating promo codes for a campaign. Um, they'll give you like the ability to generate 20,000 um, iTunes promo codes you can hand out at conventions and things like that. All right, we're done. All right, so, <laughs> so what do we learn today? The first thing is first, make a really good app. That's, if it's a given. Have a fantastic app store page. Be active as well as proactive, proactive with marketing. Don't just sit there and, ho and wait for the good downloads to come in. You have to work at this. Um, there's a lot of things you can do for free. Some things you can do for money, but I always recommend go for free first. Uh, and best of all, good luck. Thanks for watching. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, actually, you want this microphone? So everyone else can hear. So I have a very specific use case. Okay, sure. When you've made uh, an Android app. Android yeah. And then, sorry, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah, what I say, yeah, you already have an Android app, and then yeah. you, you ship the iOS version, okay? Yes. I, I haven't shipped any iOS version, but I heard that you cannot mention anything about Google, mm. anything, so you cannot say the very famous Android app is now ready for iOS. Um, I think it's usually, that's a, that's a tricky one. Like, I've, I've gotten away a bit in the word Microsoft in my keywords before. Yeah? So, so obviously, uh -huh. it, Screenshots. Yeah. We just have that word of Android. Just below the word. Yeah.
So do you have a strategy for that? If you have a good base, uh, user base for Android, and you want to promote it for U iOS? Yeah, I'd say the best thing... I'd say the best thing you can do is, obviously because Google's a bit more lax about this, is from the Google side, in your Android app, maybe have like a, a little notice saying like, hey, we have an iOS app now, you should totally check it out, and then link it to that way. Um, there's not really, I guess there's not really much you can, you can do because obviously Apple's very touch and go about Android. So anything you do on the Apple side will be a risk. Obviously it's not really bad because all that happens is you get rejected and you just fix it and try again. Um, but yeah, if you've already got a really established Android app, I'm sh I I'd recommend you can probably leverage that in, in so some way to get the word out about the iOS app. And good luck. <laughs> no worries. Any other questions? Uh, it's not really a question, more like a comment, but for the screenshots, there's also a nice uh, service called uh, LaunchKit, uh, yeah. and uh, you can upload their um, five screenshots in the biggest size, and, and it, uh, it has a web interface where you can uh, type the labels and choose the iPhone size, and it also gen generates all those uh, screenshots and all those combinations that you, you can download it uh, as a zip with every <laughs> everything in it. Uh, it's a website. It's free. It's free. They, they've got four tools. Uh, there's also uh, another tool for uh, that mon monitors uh, reviews of your app and uh, notifies you on Slack, for example. Cool. Okay. So did you hear that? There's a, there's a website called LaunchKit, which also helps streamline the incredibly hideous process of generating screenshots for your app. That's good to know. Thank you for that. Cool. Any other questions? Yep. One. Uh, so you mentioned your iComics, right? Uh, yep. That it's currently paid. Uh, currently, yeah, it's paid. Uh, but yep. you said that you might think about ch switching it to ads. Yeah. So the the thing is, like, it's it's good that it's paid. It's actually, uh, I feel like I'm very lucky in the fact that it actually sells more than ten copies a day, which is pretty rare for paid iOS apps on the App Store, from what I hear. Um, but obviously. Uh, I'm, I'm at the point now, and I'd, I'd actually think that there's more value to the app by having more users. So I want to lower, like, get rid of the paywall somehow, but not at the same time, like, just completely lose all revenue. Yeah, so but uh, my question would be: uh, I understand your point now with uh, this ad thing mm, that it might be more lucrative. But what happens to the users who already paid for the app? Well, the good thing, well, um, there was a talk in here earlier about uh, iOS app re receipt validation. We can actually get a record saying, like, okay, this is a user who paid for the app in the past. Mm -hmm. So in this case, like what I was thinking about for this model is um, it's, it has ads, but you can pay like a one-time one in-app purchase to get rid of the ads. But anyone who actually bought the app beforehand via receipt validation can say, okay, you've already paid, no ads for you. Yeah, that cool, sort of model. cool, cool, yeah. thanks. No worries. <laughs> Stand up. <laughs> Any more questions? All right, no worries, guys. There's my email on Twitter. If you have any questions, feel free to tweet me or email or just come send me after. Thanks a lot.